Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Tristan Thomas. Thanks for being on the show, Tristan. Whitney, thanks for having me. I'm really excited about it. Tristan works with Open Door Capital LLC as a nationwide infill manager. Since 2018, he has personally acquired over 55 units, including a mobile home park of his own and has been working alongside uh, Brandon Turner and his Open Door Capital Fund as their nationwide infill manager. He has also been featured on Business Insider and Bigger Pockets podcast. Uh, Tristan, welcome to the show. I know you. Know, uh, I want you to just tell the listeners a little about your story, how you got into this business but then also tell them what an infill manager is. I bet there's a lot of listeners are like, what in the world is that? Yeah, uh, you yeah. know, but tell us what that is as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll just start with a little bit about myself. Um, a young entrepreneur uh, started mobile home investing uh, three or four years back here in Maine where I live and uh, pretty quickly got just, just uh, you know, really – really deep into it and uh, met Ryan Murdoch, who was from Maine as well, who was, uh, you know, he's also and, been on the show. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So him and Brandon, uh, you know, that they got uh, into business together and they're having a great thing going. Well, long story short, they brought me along to tag along. So their very first park they bought in Maine, uh, they actually hired me to infill their park. So what that means is they had, I don't know, I think it was eight or 12 vacant pads in their mobile home park. And they hired me to go out and find homes uh, move them in, uh, you know, oversee the the rehab and and sell them off. So um, that was kind of like the test run that no one even knew about. And then they said, hey, we like this mobile home park thing. And they launched Open Door Capital Fund and said, Tristan, we'd love for you to be involved. So that's kind of how it started. And, uh, you know, I've been on with them for almost a year now. And, uh, you know, we're we're growing uh, very quickly and it's exciting. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of responsibility I have and it's just been a really cool ride. Um, so for those who don't know who, what an infill manager is, basically, like, like I said, it's, it's whenever we purchase these parks nationwide um, and there's vacant pads in, in, in the parks um, and those are zero income producing pads. They don't make any money for the park. Um, and it's my job to go out and locate a new or used home uh, that fits our criteria. And we can get into that and move it into our community and oversee the rehab and, and uh, just kind of be the infill manager. So I'm managing the infill of all of our parks nationwide. So um, it's been, it's been one crazy ride so far, but I wouldn't have it any other way. It's uh, you know, most people don't go to college to be a mobile home infill manager. I don't think there's courses out there like that, but uh, definitely bla blazing the path. Nice. Well, maybe there's a calling there for you <laughs> to create that, create that course, you know? That's right. Uh, yeah. You should, you should own that. Uh, I don't know of anybody else that's doing that. So uh, that's interesting, you know, cause it's not a term or title, you know, that you hear very often or, or, you know, hardly ever. And so it's, it's, it's great, you know, just for the listener to say, okay, you know, if I'm doing mobile home parks, you know, there's a position here for me to feel, I need somebody that's, you know, got the expertise that, that Tristan does. Uh, you know, so we can, we don't have those empty pads, right? Just Absolutely. costing us or that could be creating income, yeah. uh, you know, for our property, increasing the value, all, all those things. Um, and so let's just jump into to this role a little bit and, and what you do, Tristan, uh, you know, and, and help the listener to think about uh, uh, how to do this as well. If they don't, if they can't hire somebody like yourself, uh, you know, to, that, that's just going to specialize in that. But, uh, and then we'll get to that, the criteria, like you were talking about of that new mobile home. But, uh, but let's just go through maybe a typical day or, or what you're looking for or give us an example of a park maybe with some empty spots that you're working on and and what you're doing how we yeah. do this yeah no absolutely so i have i have my own portfolio of uh you know a, a park at about around 60 units and actually have a, two smaller parks under contract so pretty much what i do for my own stuff is just a smaller scale of what i'm doing for odc and for brandon um you know basically what it looks like is you know th these vacant pads like i was touching on earlier i mean they're not making any any income for the park owners and it's a you know an infill play it's a huge value add play for, you know for all your value add listeners out there i mean just it's like buying a you know uh, an apartment complex that's 40 percent occupied you know and then just going in there and blasting those units and, and increasing the occupancy with mobile home parks it's no different it's increasing the occupancy through bringing in a mobile home um, you know, and, and when you really look at the numbers on how value it, how valuable it is, I mean, usually you take the lot rent, maybe around 300 bucks a month times 12 divided by the cap rate. 
And, uh, you know, a lot of times just adding one, just filling one vacant pad in your park will increase the value of your, of your uh, asset or property by 30, 50, you know, 60 grand even on, on, on some cases. So, you know, when you're, when you're looking at maybe 10 or 15 or 20 grand to infill that one spot and, uh, you know, all of a sudden you have a lot paying tenant who's all of a sudden just increased your value of your property by 40 or 50 grand. You can see how, how, how much value can be added over just filling 10 spots. So, um, go ahead. When you say one home, say, you know, increase it by 20, uh, increase the value by 20 to 30 grand. Is that what you're saying? No, sorry. So, the, you know, increase you, the income. In, yeah, in, no, increase the value of your property by, by 40, 50 or 60 grand, okay. but it might only take you 20 grand to fill that spot, you know? So you're already two or three Xing the cash needed to fill that one spot uh, just by filling it with a lot paying tenant. Nice. Nice. Okay. So let's, let's talk about that a little deeper and what that process looks like. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So basically, I mean, when we have a vacant pad in our park and it, you know, I've dubbed to, to fill that pad, we always check out the pad first, check out the u utility connections, water, sewer, gas, electric, uh, you know, depending on your state municipality, you're going to have some kind of local ordinance requirements to, you know, maybe a concrete pad, gravel pad, uh, you know, there's all kinds of different things. So definitely want to want to check into that. But once you have, you know, your pad prepped and ready, uh, you're ready to go ahead and move a home on. So I mean, at this point, basically, and everything I do with Brandon and, and open door capital is all from my desktop computer here in Maine. And, and, you know, I've been really fortunate to be able to have good boots on the ground in the communities that we, that we own throughout the country that I'm really able to leverage my time and leverage, you know, my boots actually having to be there. So basically that's what we do. We, you know, we, we find boots on the ground and uh, you know, they work really closely with me and it's, it's pretty much mobile home investing, but just infilling for, for these parks. So they're learning a really valuable, uh, you know, set of skills to go out and uh, buy these homes, what to look for. Um, and then, you know, overseeing the process of moving it in. So, I mean, there's a lot of moving pieces between, you know, contractors rehabbing them, um, you know, transportation companies moving and setting them, local ordinances, um, you know, certificate of occupancy inspections, the whole nine yards. So, uh, but once you tie it together and you do 10, 20, 30 of these infill homes, I mean, the, the amount of value it adds to your park is huge, you know, and that's why a lot of people are, are, are getting into it. So. Wow. Okay. So what are some, some, I guess, pitfalls that you have or that you see, uh, or maybe some other infill managers or operators, you know, as, as they're doing this or having this process, or even, you know, you, you find a property like this and you have some land, maybe there's a dozen homes on it already. And you think, well, okay, I could fit a dozen more here. Um, you know, there's maybe you can, maybe you can't. Uh, but w what are some issues that you see through that process uh, yeah. that other people have? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think the biggest issue with anybody from trying to do this afar is the ability to locate good quality help. Uh, you know, so when we're, when we're looking for boots on the ground for me to assist me, it's imperative that, you know, they're responsive that, you know, they're, they're motivated. I mean, it really helps us out a bunch when we got, you know, a guy like Brandon Turner and open door capital name on our chest and, and, you know, we approach him and say, Hey, you know, what do you think about this idea? You know, a lot of times they're very, you know, they're very excited and motivated to help us out and, and, you know, make some money in the meantime. So, I think one of the biggest pitfalls for people is just inability to find local good quality local help. Um, you know, and, and that just goes hand in hand with, with, with my efforts. I mean, if I didn't have anybody I could count on out there in Ohio per se, you know, sitting here in Maine, I, you know, my hands are tied. So that's probably the biggest pitfall is just making sure that you have good quality, uh, you know, assistance that you can, that they're at least coachable, you know, cause I mean, this is a niche, it's a niche asset, you know, not a lot of people know what the underside of a mobile home look like, you know, they, they buy a mobile home park because they like the cash flow of it. And they like the idea of bringing in homes, but they don't really know that middle, that, that middle space. And, and luckily for me, that's how I got started in industry. So it was just something that I learned and it was second nature to me and not a lot of people want to do it. So it's worked out pretty well. Nice. Yeah. I mean, finding good help is so difficult. You know, we've been going through a hiring process and I, I've learned a lot about hiring recently, but, but finding people on the ground that will be your hands and feet when you're from a distance is, it's difficult. You yeah. know, it's very difficult. So, but let's talk about that a little bit about doing this from a distance. You know, it's not, it's a lot different than when you can actually drive there and look at something to put your hands on it and see somebody in person, you know, yourself, but you're doing this, uh, you know, from a great distance and, you know, let's talk through how you manage that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, I think it's important for, you know, and I'm sure people have heard this on, on shows before, but it's just, you know, at the end of the day, it's a limiting belief, uh, you know, that, that makes you think that you can't invest in other areas of the country. And I mean, it's, 
that, that, that really hurts, hurts you as an investor and it hurts your mentality because I mean, there's a lot of opportunity in other parts of the nation or even the world that, that's not in your backyard that you feel most, most comfortable with because you can touch it. So, I mean, I think it's imperative that, you know, in order to scale, you got to be able to let go of some of these limit, limiting beliefs. And this is certainly one of them. Uh, you know, it's even gotten to the point where my own portfolio, one of my biggest properties is 15 minutes from my house. And since I've been able to be successful and do this with Brandon from my, from my desktop, you know, I've been, I've been challenging myself and say, well, well, wait, why do I need to go and travel 15 minutes to touch my park when, you know, I, I have guys there that I trust, you know, so it's been a lot of, it's just been a transition that even, even though now I have, have stuff out of state and, and in state. I, you know, I just transition it to where, you know, I'm just doing everything from my desktop and my phone. Um, so yeah, pretty much to end that point. I mean, in order to scale, you got to get comfortable being uncomfortable, right. You know, and, and that's just one of the, yeah. that's just one of the things is, is you got to let go of the, of the fact that you can't do it. Cause you can, you just got to find the right guys, right people. It, yeah. I was going to say, and that key is finding those right people that you trust. Otherwise, yeah, you're going to have to go there or fly there. Right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If it doesn't get done uh, <laughs> properly or yeah. Uh, so what, what are some tools maybe that you have for communicating or organizing and, you know, even, you know, how do you know these things have been done? What, what have you, what do you use? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so luckily we live in the 21st century. There's, there's all kinds of technology at our fingertips. You just got to reach out and use it. Um, so the, the biggest thing that I utilize for my job is, is literally my cell phone and my cell phone video camera. Uh, you know, so whenever we need, whenever I need to get eyes on a vacant pad to discuss with the contractor, what needs to be done, or whenever I need to get eyes on a mobile home and go through and create a scope of work with a contractor, you know, I just whip out FaceTime. Or if they don't have an iPhone, we whip out, um, you know, a Facebook messenger and just have a video chat. And literally, I mean, it's very simple. We just start on one side of the room and we talk about what's there, what needs to happen. And I'm taking notes, I'm creating the scope of work and we just move through the entire home. And, uh, you know, it just makes it, it just makes it increasingly, uh, you know, easy to, to, to be there in Ohio or Wisconsin or wherever, you know, and, um, yeah, I mean, and, and you have to have a lot of trust with the guys. I mean, you got to have you trust that they're going to get the job done and drawn and the job right. But you know, with with this twenty with this technology, we have it so easy to say, hey, you know, just send me a picture as soon as you're done, you know, leveling this pad and and you know, blah blah, and 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 there it is. I've confirmed it and it's done. And and you know, I'm still sitting at my desktop in Maine and and the job's done. You know, so definitely definitely use the technology. Um, as far as like software, like we use uh, Asana for Open Door Capital, which has been great. It's just, you know, a CRM tracking software basically for our team, but it's been huge. I mean, you know, being able to, I mean, we have so much going on and we're growing so quickly and it's just been really easy for the team to get everything in one place. Uh, you know, we, we can talk to each other and, and all that. So uh, technology, man, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's a hack and, uh, you know, we're, we're using it really well. What about, uh, do you all have a method or process of, of documenting these processes or, you know, or some way that your team knows to document these things or do yeah. do things? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we got two separate sides of things. Obviously we have, you know, the management front that manages the parks. And then we have, you know, like the, the team tracking uh, stuff for all of our, all of our key points or all of our job tasks. So, I mean, obviously management company, I believe they use rent manager, which, which, which all has its own perks and they shoot out you know, uh, you know, maintenance requests and all that. But as far as us, yeah, I mean, that, what, that one place for us is Asana. That's where we can put in all of our documents, all of our, our tasks, follow up with each other, tag each other. So yeah, I mean, it's definitely one, it's best to have one centrally located spot where you can communicate with your team. How do you, how do you learn something like Asana? We use Asana, probably not to its fullest extent by no means. <laughs> uh, but how do you all, uh, you know, like even teach a new, new teammate something like Asana? Yeah. Yeah. So Asana is it's super in depth and you know, honestly, I'll be the first to admit, I'm not a super tech savvy guy. Uh, so when I first started with open door capital, in fact, I was talking to, to Ryan Murdoch and he started explaining Asana to me and he knows that I'm not super tech savvy. And he's like, man, he's like, you, you got, you know, again, it was a limiting belief that like, Hey, I just, I just didn't want to do it. I couldn't do it. He's like, Hey, you got to get, you know, again, you got to get comfortable with not being comfortable if you want to grow with us, you know? So it was That's one right. of those things where you just really got to jump in, you know, and it was great because we had team members where I was able to call and say, Hey, how, how do you do this, but it's, it's really no different than anything else. Jump in. You, you got to learn it. So, uh, it worked out pretty well. Good, good. No, I like that. It, like you, you mentioned his quote, you like, if you're, you're not willing to be uncomfortable, you're just not going to grow. It's so yep. true. Yep. So true. Uh, you mentioned earlier about, uh, and I, I wanted you to be able to, uh, uh, explain on it a little bit, but like criteria for a new mobile home. You know, if somebody has a park right now and they have a few uh, pads that are empty, they're looking at bringing, you know, what 
how do you know what kind of home you're looking for to, to make it worthwhile to bring it in there? Yeah, absolutely. So again, that's going to be a two prong answer. So like num- number one and first and foremost, check with your city, you know, mis- municipalities and local offices to see and, and your state mobile home association to see what, what even type of home you can bring in. So a lot of the times there's restrictions, uh, uh, you know, pre pre HUD, which is pre 1976 mobile homes are usually oust by all the cities, you know, they're, they're they don't want them coming into their parks. Uh, or, or their, their communities. So, you know, definitely step number one is check with the city ordinances to see what you're allowed to bring in. And then step number two is build your criteria. What kind of homes do you want to see in your park? What, you know, what kind of homes are going to increase, increase the value and increase the aesthetics of your park? So a lot of times what that turns into is vinyl sided homes with pitch shingled roofs, normally 1980s, 1990s or newer. Um, you know, so, so it's about just building that criteria. So, I mean, obviously if you have a, if you have a park with all brand new homes, you're not going to want to bring in, you know, haul in some, some metal piece of junk and try to fix it up. You know, you're going to try to keep that quality standard high or, or vice versa. If you're buying a park with a lot of old style homes, you're going to want to increase the value and the look of that park by bringing in newer homes. So, um, there's a lot of information out there, but yeah, it, it's, it goes a lot it's, and in, in owning a mobile home park community. It's, it's probably just like any other thing of commercial ass, uh, real estate. It, it's having a vision on what you want that to look like when it's done, you know, so it's a value add park. It looks like, you know, how it looks now, but when you're done with it, you want it to obviously look uh, a hell of a lot better. So, um, yeah, it's about just creating the criteria for what kind of home you want to see. Yeah, Cause then you all are, you're selling that home then to somebody who's going to rent the lot from you. Is that yep. correct? Yeah, absolutely. And then that goes into it as well. I mean, you need to know the numbers on the backside of this to make sure it lines up uh, for what you can sell it for. I mean, that's going to be pretty much decided by the market. Uh, And then, you know, so you need to find that answer out first. And then number two, you need to find out how much you can buy homes and move them in and rehab them and all that. So, I mean, as long as you're at least breaking even on that transaction, uh, you're still coming out way ahead because the value of, of that occupied lot to the park is, like I said, it's huge, you know, so that's what we try to do. I mean, we're really not in the business to make money off these homes. Um, You know, we're in the business to create affordable housing. And, you know, so we go into these markets, we find out what the average consumer can afford. And then we go out and produce that usually right at break even. And in fact, many times even taking a loss. Uh, But the value that, you know, we have by adding that lot is it's huge. So it's well worth it for us. Yes. No, I'm glad you brought that point out. Uh, it's, that's incredible to be able to do that. And are, are mobile homes selling uh, as fast as like a, a single family home right now? I mean, are, 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 how fast does, does a home like that sell? Yeah, I would say as long as you're pricing it correctly and you're, you, you know, you've done your due diligence and you're in a good market, I would venture to argue that mobile homes sell faster than single family houses right now. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's why we're in the business. It's affordable housing. Uh, you know, people can get into these homes for sometimes 10, 15, 20, 25 grand when they're looking at, you know, single family houses of a hundred grand, you know? So I just think Mm -hmm. we're, we're seeing a transition a lot in this country of people downsizing. Uh, you know, we see a lot of first time home buyers and then a lot of retirees, you know, those are usually our two bigger, biggest buyer pools. And, uh, you know, it just makes sense. It's a financially sound decision to do. And as long as you're able to offer a good, clean, uh, safe community, there's going to be no issue for demand. What's the hardest part of the syndication business for an infill manager like yourself? Yeah, no, absolutely. So basically the hardest part for an infill manager like myself is just being in, involved with the team, making sure everyone's on, on, on the right path. I mean, so Open Door Capital, we're, we're this big syndication company and there's you know eight arms right now, maybe even 10 arms right now to, to this company. And we all have to make sure we're holding hands all at once because, you know, the second one of us break away, like me, if I were to ever break away, uh, you know, from from being infill manager, that's hurt. That's hurting the team. It's hurting our fund. It's hurting our investor returns. So um, and and additionally, if Brandon were ever to break away and and, and didn't didn't raise the money we needed to close these deals, you know, we, we would lose the deals and lose money and stuff like that. So it's all about just being being a team, being together, make sure everyone's on the same page. You know, Tristan, anyone that's, that's uh, successful in business, you know, I feel has a high level of self-discipline. And how, how did you gain a high level of self-discipline? That's a great question, Whitney. I, and I, I'm glad you touched on that. I mean, because that goes kind of hand in hand with, with working from afar, uh, working on my own, you know, here in Maine. I mean, we got half the team in Hawaii and they're all working together, but we have a variety of team members just working on their own, you know, and, and you have to have a high level of discipline, discipline and and I would even argue a higher level of focus, uh, you know, so that it all just starts back with, with your why, you know? So when I first started, when I first got into real estate, I, I had just graduated college. Uh, me and my girlfriend at the time were living with my father. Uh, you know, I was doing taxes with him. He, he's a CPA and I, I was absolutely just hating it, you know? And I actually even came to tears a couple of times at my desk. Like, look, this, this, 
is terrible. Like this is not what life is supposed to be for me. Right. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, that, that's really where it kickstarted, you know, my, my focus and my love for passive income and, and, and real estate. And I was fortunate enough. I mean, I, I, I played a high level of, of division one basketball, uh, you know, and, and played basketball throughout, throughout my, my years growing up. And I think it really just started there with, you know, the desire of what you wanted to prove on. It could be anything, basketball, real estate, reading, whatever. And then just each and every day waking up with the burning desire to kick, you know, kick that goal's ass. And, and that's what basketball taught me. That's what, you know, real estate and mobile home investing taught me early on. And I'm continuing to, to learn those skills with, with Brandon and Open Door Capital. So hi, hyper focus is what I would say. What about uh, a couple of daily habits that you are just disciplined about that have helped you achieve success? Yeah, absolutely. So a couple of daily habits I have, I actually have it right here. It's, it's a to-do list. I mean, it sounds simple. I'm a, I'm a pen and paper guy, uh, but I have a column, you know, for everything I have going on and a column for everything ODC has going on. And it's, you know, every day just looking at that to-do list and knocking things out. And by the time the end of the week gets through, it's, it's four or five different colors, uh, cross marks out everything. I mean, so that's definitely number one. Uh, you know, number two, definitely just getting up every morning with, with that burning desire to do something good, you know, whether that be for, for my own portfolio or, you know, crushing hard for ODC, um, you know, so, so really just being organized on the backside. Once you really get into it, there's so many flying parts, you know, so many parts flying around that you got to keep track of. So there's just some, some way of getting it all one centralized uh, spot. And then, like I said, just, just having that desire to, to knock it out of the park. What, you know, knowing what you know now, being in the business a while, you know, doing this for, you know, often now for, for Brandon and, and for yourself being an infill manager, you know, what would you have done different on your first deal, uh, you know, now that you know what you know? Yeah, I love that question and I, and I get it pretty often and, and, and I, I would say this, I honestly, I don't think I would do anything different on my first deal or, or how I got started and I'll explain why. So when I got started, I, I only had enough money to do like one mobile home. In fact, I think I did it with my dad. I think we had like seven grand into it all in, you know, like I wasn't sitting on a bunch of money. I don't come from a bunch of money. Um, you know, so I, I, I started very small and I started in the mobile home space, not the mobile home park space. So I got a lot of education. It was hard education. It was hard work. Uh, you know, I did all the work myself and I learned everything off YouTube and stuff like that. And then trial and error, uh, you know, so I got into this space from the mobile home aspect where I would say most people get into the mobile home park space first and they don't really necessarily understand the mobile home aspect. So the reason why I say I wouldn't change anything is because, you know, I'm in this, I'm in the shoes and the position I am right now here talking to you because I started, you know, in, in, in the trenches with just mobile homes, you know? So um, I'm very fortunate to be, you know, with the team that I am today and learning as much as I am from big time guys. Um, you know, so I, I wouldn't change a thing. What's a way that you've recently improved your business that we could apply to ours? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I would just say it's systematizing. That's one of the biggest thing that I've learned from o o uh, Open Door Capital and Brandon. I mean, these guys are cutting edge at creating systems and scaling. And I've had a first row seat to exactly how to do that, you know? So that's definitely something that I've been trying to do with my own, with my own portfolio. I've offloaded it, offloaded it to a management company, you know, so I'm not dealing with the day-to-day -day tasks and, you know, as, as far as the CRMs and Google drives and just the technology side of, of systemizing things. Um, so yeah, that would be by far the, the biggest thing. Is there something you all use for that other than a sauna? Honestly, I mean, we, we use Asana a bunch, but I mean, really it's just staying, staying in contact with each other. I mean, we, we use Zoom all the time where we're doing, uh, you know, weekly calls with the whole team and then we all split up and do separate calls and we're always texting and calling and emailing. So again, it's just that constant line of communication that's working the best for us. Is there a, a method that you all follow like traction or scaling up or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of it, but 4DX, uh, I have the book somewhere. I'm drawing, drawing a blank, but it's the EOS system, um, a profit first. Um, so we've been trying to implicate, uh, in, in, you know, a lot of that, not necessarily profit first, but more so just the management uh, style. Um, you know, so we have these things called wigs, which are wildly important goals and those stand out uh, above everything else. So each one of our team members, we all identify what's our wildly important goal for this quarter. Um, and then that's, you know, that goes on the top of the list. And then everything below that list is just called what, what, what they call the whirlwind, which is just your everyday nor normal, uh, you know, stuff, which everyone has the whirlwind, you know, it, it's very stressful sometimes, but at the end of the day, it's important that everyone identifies their wildly important goal. That's going to push the team forward. Um, so yeah, I, you know, that, that I'm glad you brought that up. That's one of the biggest things about our team. And one of the biggest things I love about our team, 
um, you know, it's just everyone's identifying goals and, and helping each other out, uh, you know, uh, getting those goals done. No, oh, that's awesome. I'm glad that, that you mentioned that, but you said it's, it's called profit first. Is that the system or yes. the technique? Yeah. Profit first is the name of the book. Like I said, I have the book around here somewhere. Um, but yeah, it's the e- EOS management, um, uh, style. And yeah. Like okay. I said, yeah. EOS yeah. is, is like the traction and stuff too, I think. Okay. So yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Uh, okay. No, that's awesome. Uh, what about uh, your, your all's best source for meeting new investors right now? Um, right now our best sources for meeting new investors is just through, through Brandon's Instagram and f- through Ryan Murdoch's, uh, you know, continuous role of, of going out and, 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 and being on these podcasts. Uh, you know, so we have, I, I don't know, I think we have a unique team. I mean, we just have such an interesting platform of how we're able to reach out to investors in this day and age, you know, and, and Brandon's a, an absolute rock star, you know, and it just comes second in nature to him, you know, which, which helps out the rest of us. So, I mean, de- definitely that, that, that's our main source would be, you know, Brandon and Ryan and, and our asset manager, Brian Murray. I mean, these guys, they're all stars and they speak for themselves, you know, so it just makes it really easy. No doubt. Yeah. Brian and I are in a mastermind together and, and know all those guys. So yeah, yeah. amazing team. Yeah. Um, and so what about uh, the number one thing that's uh, contributed to your success? Ooh, that's a great one. Um, I, you know, I don't know what puts me aside. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm young and, uh, you know, I seem to be doing something right, but you know, I would have to just say like, I've kind of dropped on it a, a few times this show, uh, just that burning desire to do something more. Um, you know, I, I can't, you know, I, I'm 27 years old. I haven't been able to put a finger on it yet. Like w- w- what's, what's the driver between why I get up every morning and just want to kick butt, but it's there. And, and, and that, that's the tool I use, you know, it's just, it's there for me. Second nature. I don't know if it was trained through me through basketball or just goal setting, but, uh, you know, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm a very goal oriented guy and, uh, you know, I, I want to see the team win, you know? And so it's been really nice being a part of ODC and being able to fight for them and, and bring everything I have to the table. How do you like to give back? Give that's that's great. So I've been on a few of these podcasts already. I've been very fortunate to uh, you know to to be on and be able to share my story and share my knowledge. So um, you know I, I guess that's that's number one. But number two, you know I get a lot of people reaching out asking for advice, follow up questions. Um, you know, so I I, I absolutely love uh, love being able to help out where I can. I think my story resonates a lot with, with especially uh, new investors uh, from how I got into the mobile home park uh, mobile home niche. Uh, but additionally, you know, I've had uh, friends and, and, and colleagues get in touch with me and, and basically, uh, you know, just being able to hold their hand through the process. And, uh, you know, in a matter of, of, a, of a summer, in one instance, one, one of my friends, he was able to build a pretty, pretty good mobile home portfolio and quit his job and, and be able to be financially free, you know, so it's uh, that I definitely don't mind giving back and it's definitely well worth it for the tools I've learned those deals are, are crucial, uh, but how you do that from a distance and how you, uh, you know, just if a pad, you know, if pad's empty, it's not making money and, you know, and how you turn that around, but that, that infill play, uh, you know, you talked about uh, and just how you check the pad out, the criteria of the new mobile home park, how you do it from a distance, the importance of systems. I mean, just, uh, the, you know, I think that's so crucial. I'm glad you highlighted that. Tell the listeners though, how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you. Yeah, absolutely. So you guys can feel free to reach out to me on, on Instagram, uh, trthomas14 is the, is the handle. Um, feel free to reach out to me via email as well, Tristan at ODC fund for opendoorcapitalfund.com. I uh, will say I'm, I'm extremely, extremely busy, uh, but I do make it a point to try to get back to as many people as I can. Uh, usually one with specific questions, uh, you know, so absolutely well, well worth anybody wanting to reach out. Uh, you know, if I can help out, I definitely will. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.